The release of the redacted affidavit on the search of Mar-a-Lago is raising concern in Donald Trump's legal team that he could be indicted. But is a DOJ prosecution of a former president worth the risk of the extreme response that could result from Republicans and Trump supporters? As the New York Times notes in a brand new editorial, quote, this board is aware that in deciding how Mr. Trump should be held accountable under the law, it is necessary to consider not just whether criminal prosecution would be warranted, but whether it would be wise. No American president has ever been criminally prosecuted after leaving office. When President Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, he ensured that Nixon would not be prosecuted for crimes committed during the Watergate scandal. Ford explained this decision with the warning that such a prosecution posed grave risks of rousing ugly passions and worsening political polarization. My next guest presided over Donald Trump's second impeachment trial as president pro tem in the Senate. He first came to Washington at the age of 34 in 1975, rising to become the third in line for the presidency, as well as the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And after nearly half a century in office as one of the longest serving members of the Senate, he's retiring and reflecting on his career in a brand new memoir titled The Road Taken. Joining me now is the Democratic Senator from the great state of Vermont, Patrick Leahy. Senator Leahy, I was reminded in reading your great memoir that you're a former prosecutor. So let me ask about this issue of the day. Should the Justice Department give any consideration to the prospect of civil unrest as they determine whether to indict Trump? Well, I'm sure that is going to be a consideration. and. Uh, I can think how prosecutors are, are going to have to wrestle with this question when it is a former president. On the one hand, do you say if it's a former president you can't prosecute? Or on the other hand, do you say nobody nobody in this country is above the law, whether they're president, former president, or anybody else? It's going to be a difficult question. A lot will depend upon what comes out of these papers that were uh, were seized. You know, uh, Donald Trump has shown a, a disdain for classified material. When he was early on in his presidency, he disclosed to the Russian foreign minister with a camera going and a recording machine uh, going in the room, very, very top secret intelligence, which put in danger one of our allies uh, clandestine efforts. It put in danger their uh, agents. They had to yank them out of the countries where they were. It was some of the most sensitive information we had. And in a bragging way, he gave it to the uh, Russian foreign minister. Uh, now, that may be because of the feelings he has toward Russia. He also, uh, when Putin went into Ukraine, he called him a genius. I call him a war criminal. <clears throat> I've, always, I've always believed that a prosecutor needs to make a determination as to whether there's sufficient evidence of a crime having <clears throat> been committed and a belief that they can successfully prosecute someone for that crime. I, I don't know where to go. Where, wherein lies the citation for this, this third consideration of, for lack of a better descriptor, the impact on society? Well, I, I, uh, I was a prosecutor, as you said, for eight years. I had to make decisions who to prosecute. Uh, I prosecuted Democrats, Republicans, people in, in high uh, office. And I had to do it, but I was never faced with a question like this. Uh, I would say, incidentally, earlier you talked about the fraud and, and the COVID money. I would prosecute those people to the fullest extent. I want to see them go to prison. I want the example made that if you uh, uh, commit fraud on a government like that, you'll go to prison. You won't get a slap on the wrist. You won't get a fine. You'll go to prison. Senator Leahy, quote, the Senate is a broken place. I, I read and really enjoyed <clears throat> elements of your book. Among the many vignettes, you talk about Iron Mike Mansfield with his backroom bar. It occurs to me that if the backroom bar existed today in the Senate, it would be segregated 
by R's and D's. Like, wherein lies the break of the camaraderie that you enjoyed for so many years that no longer exists? Well, it was a, it was a gradual thing. I think a lot of it came after the, uh, what Newt Gingrich did in the House in polarizing and, and ignoring the example of his predecessor, uh, Bob Michael, and said it's going to be one party controlling issues, and a lot of those members indicate, came to the Senate and they felt the same way. I've always felt the Senate should be the conscience of the nation. We ought to come together. Uh, I've been very successful in a lot of my legislation I proposed, but only because I've gone and sought out Republicans to work with me across the political spectrum. The, uh, they're slowly coming back to having some meetings together, but it's become too polarized. We, we used to have a dining room where Republicans and Democrats were in there at each other's table uh, talking over issues. The vice president of both parties would come and join, and things got worked out. It's not happening that way now, and it is too polarized. Uh, we've seen far, far more filibusters than ever before. Uh, it is not the way the Senate should be or could be. One of the reasons I wrote the book, The Road Take It, was to show the arc of where the Senate had been, what it could be, and where it's ended up. Now, we have sometimes we do come together, aid to Ukraine being one, but nowhere near enough, and it's hurting the country. I think that young people who read the memoir, and I recommend it, will be shocked to hear of the collegiality that did exist when you came aboard in the 70s and the 80s until some period in 1990s. 